Good morning and thank you for joining us for this webinar today on Real Estate Perspectives 2021. We're delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about what we might see in the retail and occupier development and residential markets over the next year or so. By way of introduction, I'm Katie Klingopoulos, a legal director in the real estate department at BDB Pittmans based in Cambridge. With a background of working for residential and mixed use developers in both Cambridge and London over the last 10 years, my particular focus is on development across East Anglia, London and the South East. And this morning, I will provide a brief overview of some of the changes we might see to legislation which could have an impact on developers. I'm also pleased to be joined by my colleagues, Tim Middleton and Simon Burson. Tim joined BDB Pittmans at the beginning of September last year as a partner in our private real estate group. Tim has a wealth of experience in all residential property matters and comes to us from a Cambridge-based firm where he led the largest residential team in the city, specialising in providing high levels of service to their clients. And today, he will provide a view of the state of the residential market as we head into the brave new world of 2021. Simon set up the Cambridge office of BDB Pittmans in 2017 and heads up the commercial real estate team. Simon has over 25 years experience acting for the full range of real estate clients on transactions from the complex to the day to day. Simon's focus is on investors in real estate and corporate occupiers with an emphasis on the retail sector and he's here to give an overview of the trends within those sectors. Just a couple of housekeeping points before I hand over to Simon. We'd love to hear from you during the session with your questions or observations on the market and the second half of this, um, uh, this webinar will be in a Q&A format with my colleagues Will Thomas, a senior associate in our Cambridge residential team, and Joe Taylor, an associate in the Cambridge Real Estate Department. So please do contribute to the discussion by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, where you have the option to post either with your name or anonymously. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, please use the chat facility and our events team will be able to assist you. Finally, we will be recording the session and it will be made available on our YouTube channel shortly afterwards and you're very welcome to share it with any colleagues who might also find this helpful. Without further ado, Simon, could you now join the stage, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that, Katie. Um, I'm going to start the session off by looking at the future of the retail and office markets in 2021. Uh, although I won't be looking at the Cambridge and regional market in particular, my overview will apply as much to our home patch as the rest of the country. I thought I would wake us up gently by putting forward some of my own thoughts on the market rather than starting off with the law, especially as we're missing the usual bacon butty in our virtual world. Although I'd be very happy to pick up in the q and I'm not going to mention the immediate hot topics such as business rates, delayed forfeiture and the way out of COVID over the next three or more months. We have all been deeply immersed in the difficulties of this year and have spent the last 10 months working our way through countless issues which could not have been imagined before 2020, providing solutions and frankly, just coping. I would not wish to appear naive or overly optimistic, although that is perhaps my nature, but I believe that the real estate industry is starting to be heads up on looking forward past COVID. We all know the long lead in times for real estate transactions, whether you are an occupier, developer or an investor, means that in new thinking relates to Q2 this year, at the very earliest and more realistically Q3, which will hopefully mean that we are past the worst of the pandemic, or at least that is the way I like to think. During the time of COVID, I have in my own mind been trying to articulate a sense I had of how the markets would develop generally. As a result, I grandly announced to my team that I thought I had invented a new word, humanonics. Turns out that I hadn't, and indeed, someone in Canada has trade, tried to trademark it. On further inquiry, this refers to the academic study of combining the perceived self-interest of traditional economic thinking with humanist interests of feeling, wanting, thinking, and knowing. Given the 10 minutes I have, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not about to try to redefine the principles of economic theory. I couldn't, even if I wanted to, given a week. I'm also less interested in the academic study than what this might mean to how the economy develops and in particular, the real estate market. Everywhere we look at the moment, 
we are being told that COVID has redefined the office and retail environment. But has it? It would seem to me that this has been happening for some time due to the march of the digital world and the potential for artificial intelligence to take some of the so-called mundane roles in today's economy. COVID has doubtless accelerated this process. And we've all learned that we do not need to visit shops or go to offices. Need is, I think, the key word in all of this. What do we need to do and what do we want to do as humans? At the same time as COVID has taught us that we can cope, it has shown us that human interaction is fundamental to our wants. Next slide, please. You may have seen the commentary from Peter Williams, the chair of Superdry and Mr. Specs in Retail Week. And this quote, which I particularly like, given that I'm an unemployed historian. Centuries ago, every city and large town had a square, a place to meet for commerce and social interaction. The square was bordered on each side by buildings that provided somewhere to pray, church, learn, school, and be ruled by government. On the fourth side of the square was the market, a bustling space for commerce, which in those sadly long forgotten days when we could travel freely was always on our must visit list because of the connection with the locale and its vibrancy and color. Of course, today, the reference to government can easily be read to mean offices generally. In both the retail and office sector, there will need to be a post COVID plan as to how retailers and occupiers are going to use shops and offices to cater for their customer base or their workforce. It is my view that neither shops nor offices are about to be consigned to the historic waste bin as cash seems to be. Rather, the function of these spaces will need to be redefined around their use by all of us humans, which means not just being driven by economic need, but also to cater for people's wants. Next slide, please. Looking at the retail sector in a little more detail, and before I do, I should of course declare my interest that I am a real estate lawyer. So you might fairly think I would say that, wouldn't I? This is just an opinion piece and I would be very happy to debate these points. Retailers are of course very familiar with the ideas of destination shopping. To go back to the town square idea, it seems the economic attraction of the online offer has left many confused as to which way to turn. Current commentaries seem to want to make us believe that this is now a binary decision between the cost advantages of the online offer and the traditional bricks and mortar. As always, the apparently more progressive ideas will get most airtime, but I believe it is far less straightforward. In reality, it is far more about brand than about the vehicle which carries it, along with the demographic for the product. Brand is always king and the ability to innovate and change is also vital for any retailer to thrive, whether online or on the high street. Again, it's my view that there is going to need to be an even closer relationship between the landlord and the retailer. COVID has clearly strained this relationship. And as a result, there is some talk in the market of landlords becoming more hard nosed about collecting rents once the moratorium on forfeitures expires on 31st March, 2021, if not extended. And while this sounds like a fight worth winning in the short term, I don't think it would help the market to function in the long term. It is clear that the retail sector is going through a sustained period of rationalization. And in most cases, the moratorium has genuinely helped to protect businesses which simply cannot afford to pay the rent while there has been no footfall. The exercise of the rights of forfeiture will create voids without new tenants to replace them. We saw after the financial crisis in 2008, that the debt market had no buyers for the properties which they had called in. So the banks either extended the debt payment period, worked the asset out with the borrower administrator, or even in some cases took an equity stake. Landlords, just as much as the banks did in 2008, will now need to think more to the long term and imaginatively how to maintain the market. One way that the landlord and tenants can work together to recreate that post COVID retail destination is perhaps to restructure their leases to include a turnover element, or even to consider the whole of the rent being calculated on a turnover basis. This is of course not a new idea, 
but it's not one which has been widely used in the past for fear of landlords taking too much risk. However, we have been working with a couple of clients now for over 15 years, which other than in exceptional circumstances, pay rent entirely based on turnover. The model of turnover top-up is more common, but the landlord agreeing to 100% turnover lease shows commitment and understanding of the tenant's business model and brand, as well as the need for the landlord to make the building or center a true destination for shoppers to ensure there is enough footfall to support the tenant's income, and so it's turnover rent. The landlord and the tenant become partners in making sure that the retail location caters for the human want and overcomes the economic need of the online offer. On a more practical note, one issue which does need further market consideration is the use of online shopping, which inevitably leads to click and collect in the context of turnover leases. <clears throat> Excuse me, not just in the terms of attributing online sales to turnover, but also the floor area which can then be committed to collect and collect facilities. It is more, it's clearly more of an issue for the larger retailers, but it seems to me that the market has not yet found the balance of fairness on this point, but is trying to feel its way towards it. I'm unclear as to what the answer is, as there are so many variables, but landlords and tenants will need to grapple with this issue to ensure the contract remains balanced between the two. Next slide, please. To finish with a view on off the office market, it seems to me that the every time you get a group of professionals together on a Zoom call to discuss the market or technical issues, it will at some point descend into a conversation around the question of what are you going to do with your offices? Indeed, yesterday I had just that conversation. Again, this is far more than a binary issue of it being the home or the office. It comes back to the issues of humanomics. Most of us with children will be familiar with the morning pleas to not go to school until COVID came along, and it turned out to be a far better option than being at home. Many employees have missed the human interaction that an office provides not only for individual health and well-being, but also for business creativity and productivity. I know I run the risk of being seen as a reactionary dinosaur promoting the benefits of the office but neither should we be seduced by the benefits of improved IT and the immediate opportunities for cost savings by closing down offices for the home desk. It is clear to me that any business with a workforce of a certain size will need offices, even if that is just a hub for co-working and meetings as and when required. Office space will need to become far more versatile and also even more closely connected with the ability for home working as a common feature of business life. This will become a choice as such businesses will need to reflect on the costs of office space, especially the need for enhanced IT infrastructure. An office is still a long-term commitment, which needs to be a secure, stable and committed workforce. But if you spend more on less, I think businesses will be able to get the return on this commitment to the creativity and productivity gains. Just to end on uh, what some people may think is a very, uh, uh, a boring subject, but one clear to my heart, uh, as I've got a platform for, for, for a short while, is the question of way leaves. Um, those that have interacted with the way leaves before will uh, understand some of the frustrations. Um, we will need offices, and we will need to get them to the home, no doubt. And as a result, that IT connection is going to become even more important than ever. Some really innovative businesses are able to work in the cloud, but most professional businesses still need that secure server connection as information is still more often than not power and so securing that vitally sensitive commercial data is either necessary for maintaining your competitive advantage or keeping your clients information safe. This inevitably leads to the need for a way leave agreement between landlord, tenant and operator, which always in my experience takes on a life of its own. And for such a key piece of the legal jigsaw is often forgot about until too late, and so delays the occupation of the offices, even when the fit out may have been completed. If your business is thinking of or in the process of taking new space, or you're working with clients on relocations, do question the IT team as to what they need and how they are going to procure it to make sure that they have thought about what legal documentation they will need. Please ask them and ask them again. It needs to be managed, but the end user always 
by the end user, apologies, but has to be managed by the end user and they must not use on a turnkey IT solution. As in my experience, that very rarely materializes with a lot, a lot of effort upon the part of the user and the occupier. In summary, we will continue to need shops and offices to satisfy, if nothing else, the human desire for contact. But we are going to have to think imaginatively and practically as to how to deliver these spaces in the digital age. Thank you very much. I'd like to now hand back to Katie. Thank you very much, Simon, for that insightful summary of the office and retail environment. Talking about the, uh, the development sector and likely changes which we might be seeing in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, the legal framework for development is undergoing significant change with government consultations having come thick and fast during 2019 and 2020. The pandemic has put a number of these on ice, but it's likely that the next couple of years will see some significant changes which will have an impact on how developments look and feel, their contribution to sustainability and the provision of affordable homes. Proposals to reform the planning system were announced in the summer of 2020 and were well publicised, if sometimes misreported. But other changes are due, and whilst there is a bit of uncertainty as to when they will come into force, there is some certainty that they will happen in the not too distant future. I will provide a high level overview of five such changes which run along the themes of sustainability, affordability and community engagement, which I hope will be useful to you. Next slide, please. So firstly, the Environment Bill. The Environment Bill covers a large amount of ground and is one of the key pieces of Brexit legisl legislation covering environmental regulation post-EU. It includes provision for the setup of the Office for Environmental Protection, Waste and Resource Efficiency, Air Quality, Environmental Standards and Chemicals. In respect of development, Although the current MPPF includes a hierarchy for management of biodiversity with relocation, mitigation and compensation in descending order, the new bill will impose a stricter obligation to create net gain, not just minimise biodiversity loss. There will be a requirement for a minimum of 10% biodiversity net gain on all developments and all planning permissions will be granted with a deemed condition requiring a biodiversity net gain plan to be submitted pre-commencement. In addition, public authorities will have a general duty to conserve and enhance biodiversity. The bill is still in the report stage in the Commons, having been delayed firstly because of the 2019 general election and secondly because of the pandemic. And the government has just announced that there will be further delays because there is not enough capacity to cover it during the current parliamentary session, which clearly has caused some frustrations. The text of the bill is still under scrutiny and we will need to wait for regulations to be published before understanding fully how this will work in practice. In particular, we need further details on the circumstances in which biodiversity credits can be purchased as opposed to net gain being delivered on site and what exemptions will be available and these may prove contentious. In terms of exemptions, the current bill exempts permissions granted by a development order or for an urgent crown development we think it might also exempt some brownfield sites and some small residential self-builds. However, developers shouldn't assume that there will be exemptions automatically for smaller sites, as this is not covered at the moment, although there may be a limitation in the rules which apply to those sites. Next slide, please, Melissa. So secondly, electric vehicle charging. Now, the Department of Transport consulted last year on its proposal to require EV charging points in new residential and commercial buildings as part of its road to zero strategy. The headline points were that all new residential buildings with associated car parking should include charging points. All existing residential buildings with more than car ten, uh, 10 car parking spaces which undergo renovation should at least have one charging point and cable routes in all other car parking spaces. All new commercial buildings with more than 10 car parking spaces should have at least one charging point and additional cable routes in other spaces. And all existing commercial buildings with more than 20 car parking spaces should have at least one charging point by 2025. 
It's been identified as an opportunity to improve zero carbon transport by including this within development. As in some cases, it costs about half the price to install during the development than by retrofitting. But of course, it will increase development and redevelopment costs. There's also some issues to iron out, particularly in developments where car parking is not located within the boundary of buildings or dwellings. And consideration needs to be given to how security of the charging points are managed. It also needs to be considered what the capacity and location of substations need to provide within those developments and whether the cost is chargeable to tenants when retrofitting existing buildings. The proposed lead time for regulations had been March 2021. <coughs> Excuse me. However, the consultation closed in 2019 and there has been no progress since. There's no updates at the moment. However, there is a current consultation on the future of transport for rural areas, and it may be that this comes to life once that consultation has closed. Next slide, please. The, the government is consulting on changes to parts L and F of the building regulations in relation to its future home standard. They propose that new homes would be expected to have a 75 to 80% lower carbon emissions than current stock. And the government is now consulting on the second part of the standards to deal with ventilation and overheating, which is currently open until April and is available on the gov.uk website. Interim regulations are also planned for late 2021 to come into effect in 22, and draft regulations are also available online. One particular sticking point with the future home standard is that the government also proposed to restrict local planning authorities from setting higher standards than the future home standard, which authorities said could impair them from achieving their net zero carbon goals by going beyond the standards set by government. <coughs> the government has since slightly backtracked and confirmed that for the time being, local authorities will be permitted to set higher standards but they have maintained that in the long run, it would be preferable for developers to have certainty over the standards by including a flat rate across the country. Next slide, please. Fourthly, shared ownership. And the government is consulting on changes to the shared ownership model um, at the moment. There are some key principles within the consultation. Uh, so firstly, the initial minimum stake, uh, which can be purchased as a share owner, would be reduced to 10% as opposed to 25. There's a proposal to allow staircasing in increments of 1% per year without requiring a new valuation, but with the price being adjusted up or down in line with local house price inflation. Landlords are required to provide index valuations for gradual staircasing, <clears throat> at least once per year and for staircasing in larger shares the current valuation requirements will still apply. There will also be a 10-year repair free period <clears throat> which will cover building and structural repairs and repairs to the external fabric of the building. Apologies my throat is just going. always has to happen while I'm in the middle of a talk. So the, the repair free period will cover buildings and, and structural repairs and repairs to the external fabric of the building, but service charge will still be charged for general maintenance and upkeep and shared owners will be expected to pay in the normal manner. Shared owners will re remain responsible for repairs inside the home, although they will have an ability to make a reclaim for faulty installations of up to 500 pounds per year. It will only apply for the first 10 years of the property's life, not necessarily the first 10 years of the shared ownership lease or until the shared owner reaches 100% ownership. And finally, they are also creating a new right to shared ownership for social tenants, which is intended to apply, to apply for all new rented homes funded through the Affordable Homes Programme. Now, the principles of the new model lease were under technical consultation until last December, and the model lease itself was due to be published early 2021, although there's no news on this yet. 
the incremental staircasing is designed to reduce the costs associated with staircasing and encourage more take up as this is something the government has identified as being prohibitive with additional fees involved with the staircasing. But the interesting point is the repair free period, which is likely to attract attention, particularly given recent commentary on service charges, particularly in the context of cladding. And I think an important aspect of this will be ensuring that shared owners, owners are provided clear information at an early stage as to the limitations of the repair free period to ensure there's no misunderstandings. Next slide. So finally, the first home scheme. The government is, has been consulting on offering discounted homes for local first time buyers and that consultation closed last year. The government has now published its response and is working to finalise the details of the scheme. However, it is trying to bring it forward as soon as possible. The scheme is expected to provide for the delivery of homes to first time buyers for at least a 30% discount to market value. The discount will apply in perpetuity and in some parts of the country, a discount of up to 40 or 50% will be permitted depending on the affordability ratios. First homes will be available to those with a local connection with local planning authorities setting out what this means for their area. However, local restrictions are expected to only apply for up to three months from when a property goes on sale and developers will be required to provide evidence that they have actively marketed the houses to local people before the restrictions can be lifted. There will be price caps applied of £250,000 outside London, £420,000 inside London and income caps will also apply for the eligible buyers. The first homes will have a restrictive covenant to ensure that discounts are passed on to future purchases and restrictions on lettings are, will be imposed to ensure they're used as principal homes. The government intends to develop a model agreement for first homes and a mortgagee protection clause to provide reassurance to lenders and secure the finance coming into the market. And it's expected that first homes will constitute a minimum of 25% of all affordable units secured through developer section 106 contributions. Now that was a very, very quick run through five key points and there was a lot of detail there I appreciate. Um, if anyone would like details of the consultations I was referring to, um, do drop me in line and I can uh, send over the links to the various, uh, various pages on the gov.uk website if they're interested. So that's the development side covered. Um, I can now pass you over to Tim Middleton, who will look at the residential side. If you would like to join the stage, Tim. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my opening line was going to be about whether you could have a graveyard slot at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, and if so, then this is it. But unfortunately, Simon seems to have been uh, the graveyard slot for us today, which I think is a real pity because he had an excellent presentation. So I hope we can uh, record that and, and people can watch it later on if they want to. Um, nevertheless, uh, I'm going to keep this relatively short and relatively light, I hope, um, hoping that some people will be awake by the end of it. Although I should add for anybody who's seen me present recently, I'm afraid there's going to be no photographs of motorbikes in this one. So. Um, if I could start with the first slide, please. It's, it's about the residential marketplace generally. Um, I'm not going to spend much time speculating on what is going to happen to the market for residential property in forthcoming months and years. Uh, that is because there are analysts and commentators who are far better qualified than I am to predict what might happen in the future. In particular, some of the large agency firms employ their own economic experts to statistically analyze past trends and economic indicators to enable them to model what future trends might be. And yet I'm not aware of any commentators who successfully predicted the sustained boom in the residential property market, which occurred after the lockdown of last spring was eased. From which I have concluded that predicting the future is a mugs game and not one that I am going to play. Next slide, please. 
However, I will make one observation about the market for prime residential property in Cambridge, which is the one in which I have predominantly operated. And this is that it has proved remarkably resilient in the past. I arrived in Cambridge at the end of a deep recession when prices and activity across the country had slumped severely, including prime Cambridge residential property. And yet, within a couple of years, prices had largely recovered and activity levels were back to normal. And when the London market declined badly a few years ago, Cambridge remained largely unaffected. This is because there is a very limited supply of prime residential properties in Cambridge and a trans transient and wealthy population which competes strongly for them. Thus, buyers of these properties commonly have to enter into a lockout agreement to secure them and a good number never even come to the market at all. So I am cautiously optimistic that Cambridge will weather some of the headwinds that are probably coming our way better than most markets will. Since I'm not going to comment further on the market itself, I will therefore consider some legal trends which could impact on the future for residential real estate in the months and years to come. Next slide, please. Unless your home is a cave in outer Mongolia, you will know that the SDLT holiday the government introduced after the first lockdown will end on 31st March. Indeed, a strong argument could be made that I should be helping Mrs Miggins to complete her purchase of 7 Acacia Avenue rather than speaking to you this morning, or well, I'd rather be speaking to you. With anyone who can complete their purchase before 31st March standing to save up to £15,000 of STLT, it does not take a soothsayer to predict that the next few weeks are going to be extremely busy for those of us transacting residential properties. As a result of which, I'm going to make my one cast iron prediction of this presentation. And that is that I will be taking some holiday in April. There has been much speculation about whether the government might extend the holiday because of the cliff edge nature of its ending and the impact this might have on the market generally. Indeed, only last week, a debate took place in parliament in which Predictably enough, the MPs who took part were of the view that the holiday should be extended, whilst equally predictably, the government spokesman gave no such commitment. My own view is that the country has hemorrhaged far too much money already keeping the show on the road, and that the only circumstances in which this might happen would be if the government felt forced to prevent house moving in March in order to control the virus and there's nothing to suggest that might happen at this point. So, what will happen after the 31st of March? There is little doubt that there will be a period of adjustment and, and a hiatus in the market. If residential property lawyers are flat out at the moment, then that is generally getting existing transactions through by the deadline, rather than taking on the new ones which would form their pipeline for the spring and early summer. Whether things get back to normal, and if so, when, I will again leave others to speculate upon. Next slide, please. I have thought for some time that there could be a significant difference between the markets for freehold and leasehold residential properties in Cambridge. I remember a few years ago selling a nice leasehold apartment overlooking the river, which I had bought for my client some 10 years previously. And I'm surprised to see how little it had increased in price during that time, having seen freehold properties do so by considerably more than that amount in the same period. If I am right, then with so many new apartments having been built in Cambridge recently, the law of supply and demand suggests that this trend might continue and even increase. But there are also legal problems for leasehold flats, which can only exacerbate any such division of which the problems which have arisen after the fire at Grenfell Tower are the most significant. Since these have recently received national coverage in newspapers and on television and radio, I imagine most of you will be familiar with them. But put briefly, these are the issues. Firstly, 
the government decreed that all blocks of flats should be inspected to establish whether they had cladding of the type used at Grenfell. A new form EWS1 was introduced by which it could be certified that the building was or was not safe. And mortgage lenders decided they would not lend on flats in a building which did not have a clear certificate. Unfortunately, there were hardly any inspectors available to, to produce these forms for the thousands of buildings which needed them, and the result was tens of thousands of flats became unsaleable. Secondly, if an EWS1 form could be obtained, but then confirmed that there is cladding which needs replacing, the cost can run into many millions of pounds. At present, the most likely contributors to these costs are the leaseholders through their service charges, which means they could be looking at potential one-off costs of tens of thousands of pounds in a single service charge year. The result, more unsaleable flats. At this point, I was going to say that there is speculation the government will fund the cost of these works, and that I didn't think this would happen for the same reason that the SDLT holiday is unlikely to be extended, or that developers will be forced to do so. And I thought that would be difficult, so, so long as they had complied with the current building regulations when the development was completed. However, yesterday the Guardian carried a story which says that the government will today announce a £5 billion grant for leaseholders and a £2 billion levy on developers. So perhaps it is just as well I decided not to play the speculation game. We will have to see how this plays out but it is likely that leaseholders will still have to pick up a proportion of the costs for cladding removal. And in the long run, the most likely solution to this will be the creation of a scheme enabling the amount of those costs to be borrowed on a long-term basis. That way, the repayments and interest could be factored into the annual service charge spread over, say, 25 years. This will avoid the one-off hit which most leaseholders will be unable to afford and will provide the transparency that's regarding payment of these costs in the future, which all buyers will require. However, in the meantime, again, many flats will remain extremely difficult to sell. Next slide, please. In recent years, it has increasingly been asked whether the leasehold regime has a future for the sale and ownership of blocks of flats. This has largely been fueled through problems caused by the many flat leases which have recently been granted with excessive ground rents and frequent escalations in those rents. Once more, this has caused thousands of flats to become unsaleable. After years of increasingly strident statements and a number of different reviews, in January this year, the government announced its proposals regarding residential leasehold with great fanfare. These are, firstly, that existing leaseholders will have the right to extend the terms of their leases to 990 years with no ground rent being payable. Secondly, that a common hold council will be set up to finally get common hold adopted as the favoured regime for owning and managing blocks of flats. This is all well and good, but, as with so many government announcements, this begs as many questions as it answers. In this ca case, the big questions are these. Next slide, please. What would the price for an extended lease be? The announcement mentioned that the concept of marriage value will be abandoned. That's the enhanced price a freeholder will receive for an extended lease when the existing lease has less than 80 years of its term remaining. But generally, a significant part of the price to be paid for an extended lease derives from the income stream, stream which the lessor will lose by having the ground rent reduced to zero. This means that those with high and escalating ground rents are often unable to afford the price of even the current 90 year extensions. Now, governments have generally been loath to reduce the value of property assets by means of legislation of this type. 
So it remains to be seen how the price of these new extended leases will be determined and whether they represent the passport out of the troubles which so many existing leaseholders are suffering from at present. Next slide, please. Will common hold ever be adopted as the true alternative to residential leases? It's approaching 20 years since common hold was introduced to the UK and it has laid dead in the water ever since. That first scheme may not have been perfect, but it is intrinsically a fair system because it gives control of the building to those with the greatest interest in it, the flat owners. It has also underpinned the condominium system in the US and been used for many years in countries such as Australia. So why has it not worked here? Apart from some obvious shortcomings in that first iteration, the overwhelming reason is that developers have failed to adopt it when setting up their schemes. Indeed, far from doing so, since Common Hold was introduced, some developers have exploited the leasehold re regime by imposing high and escalating ground rents in order to enhance the residual value of their freeholds, or worst of all, have sold leases of houses and included an escalating ground rent in those as well. So is there a reason to believe that things might be different this time around? There is, and this is why. Firstly, the practices of those rogue developers who exploited the leasehold system have been the subject of intense press and government scrutiny, which has largely fueled the current proposed changes. Secondly, the government has finally got up ahead of steam and is intent on legislating on leasehold reform, even finding time for this amongst all the stringencies caused by Brexit negotiations and a certain virus. But the main reason why it might happen this time is because the government has also said that all future leases of residential properties must be granted with no ground rent being payable. With no income attached to the freehold, suddenly the attraction to developers of retaining freehold titles will have gone, and there should be no reason why they will not want to pass the building on to the flat owners so that they can move on to their next development. Common hold is the natural vehicle for doing so. When making their announcement in January, the government declared that this was the greatest shakeup in leasehold law for 40 years. For once, they might have underplayed it, for if common hold becomes the accepted vehicle used for selling flats, most future developments of residential flats will have left leasehold law behind forever. Well, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to pass back to Katie to run the next part of the session. Uh, we've obviously now uh, got Joe and Will joining us as well. Um, and I thought we might start, while, while it's fresh in your mind, Tim, I wonder whether we might start with a question, uh, question to you. Uh, so, there's a, it's not why am I wearing a suit when nobody else is, is it, Katie? Uh, that, that, that could be one of the questions, absolutely. Um, I was actually more going to ask about the freehold and leasehold divide um, and uh, the fact that we've got an awful lot of uh, leasehold properties in, in Cambridge. Uh, we, and we, we've had a, a um, previously submitted question through, which was, along those lines, um, uh, asking about an article about the uh, death of Bytelet, um, or purported death of Bytelet, due to the gradual administrative and legisl legislative squeeze. Could it be true? And would that be combined with an oversupply? And could that help bring prices down further in the residential market, do you think? I think, I think the Bytelet market has been dying for a while now. I, I think it must be a couple of years ago, I remember having a conversation with an estate agent who was about to launch a, a new block of flats and so on. And, and he told me that when he'd done a, a, a similar launch a year previously, he'd expected to sell 80 to 90% of the flats to buy to let investors. 
and a year later it was completely the other way around. Um, so having said that, ironically enough, I've got to ring somebody at 10 o'clock about trying to get their buy to let purchase through by the 1st of April. So uh, it hasn't completely died. Um, it, essentially, it was a it was an investment decision, wasn't it? Buy, buy to let became a way, a way of putting your money somewhere where you would it was safe and you would get a better return than putting it elsewhere. And that has been changed by increased stamp duty land tax and taking away uh, other tax breaks and so on, so that it is now a less in, attractive in, um, place to invest your money. That could change in the future, but it's also been a, a political decision because the government wanted to um, get the buy to let investors out of the market so so that prices would be more realistic for first time buyers and, and such like. Um, and I, I think it probably has had that effect. I guess perhaps that uh, that chimes in with part, part of what I was talking about with the, the first homes scheme um, and that there is a focus within government on uh, pushing home ownership um, and, and per perhaps that's that's at the expense of the private buy to let market. It's also worth adding that, that it links back to the cladding thing as well, because a lot of these flats owned by buy to let investors will have cladding issues and that's going to reduce their return again and also there's a <clears throat> there's a limit um, on how much it, so assuming that the government does provide this scheme and and people can benefit from it in relation to their, their the flats that they own there will be a limit on how much buy to let investors can um, guess I think it's 200,000 euros or something which sounds like a lot, except that if you own 20 flats or whatever, and they've all got cladding problems, that won't actually go that far. Thanks, Tim. Joe, uh, we've, we, we, we've had a question in about um, estate rent charges, which of course I've, I haven't uh, mentioned during, uh, during my talk today. And th th there's some talk about um, uh, uh, the government considering changes to the law on freehold estate charges or estate rent charges, uh, depending on how you know them, to put them on a similar footing to leasehold service charges. Um, do, do you think developers should be worried about this? And what do they need to know about the new proposals? Okay, um, thanks. Thanks for that. So just to sort of recap the, the, the current positions. Um, Maintenance of, of common parts and state roads up until adoption um, on new housing estates are usually dealt with by sort of one of two ways, um, either a service charge in a leasehold uh, arrangement uh, or by way of an estate rent charge for freehold homeowners. Um, currently, the most popular um, sort of arrangement is, is the, the leaseholder uh, service charge setup. And importantly, with with these sorts of arrangements, um, there are various legal protections in, in place to um, protect the homeowners. Um, first, they've, they've got to be consulted uh, in relation to um, um, the charges. Um, the charge must also be reasonable um, and any dispute uh, that does arise uh, must be referred to the property chamber tribunal, I, I think, um, and that's a much more streamlined uh, process. Um, I, I agree that the, the government's attitude towards the grant of long leases um, on residential estates is likely to see a, a rise in the um, in, in, in freehold uh, estate charges. And in, and in these circumstances, houses would be sold on a, on a freehold basis and the developer would retain um, the common parts and the estate roads. Um, then the developer or a management company uh, would then maintain the common areas uh, and often require the freeholders to to, um, to, to contribute to the cost of, 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 of maintenance. Uh, importantly, in this freehold arrangement, there isn't, um, there isn't the same level of protection. Um, there's no reasonableness test, um, and any dispute must be referred to the Small Claims Court, uh, which is a, a much more drawn out um, uh, affair and, and, and can rack up significant costs. Um, the government has, has now committed, uh, I believe, to um, to um, giving freeholders the equivalent rights uh, as leaseholders. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's no timetable for this, uh, but um, obviously there's, the government has other things on its mind at the moment. So 
I think um, you asked whether should the developers be worried, um, and, and the answer, well, my, my opinion is not, not unduly. Yeah, the, the changes introduce some form of parity between leaseholders and, and, and freeholders, uh, and it seems fair that a freehold homeowner benefits from the same protection as a leaseholder. Um, in particular, the estate charges should be reasonable and that a suitable uh, and appropriate dispute resolution procedure is in place. Uh, the key to note is that developers of houses will need to consider reserving rent charges if they want to recover the cost of estate uh, management fees. And also, as a final point, and as with service charge arrangement and leasehold arrangement, care will need to be taken when drafting the, um, the estate rent charges to ensure that they cover everything that it needs to. Thanks, Jay. Will, coming over to you. Um, another area where the sale and purchase of leasehold transactions suffer in comparison to freehold properties relates to the management information which is required to obtain from the landlord or the managing agents. Are there proposals to regulate this area to make the provision of such information both quicker and cheaper? Morning, everyone. Um, the quick answer is yes, but they are just proposals. If you've ever dealt with the flat, buying or selling, you'll be aware of the pinch point um, management packs pros, whether through delays, difficulties in getting them costs, it can be a nightmare for us sometimes. In 2019, the um, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government ended a consultation in relation to this and came up with three proposals. Nothing's happened since then, so the proposals are still live, but they're hardly the top of the legislative agenda at the minute. So they, they said that the first is that these packs must be limited to £200 plus VAT. Um, you have to provide information within 15 days and you can't charge more than £50 for updating them because sometimes they go stale and you need to pay again to have the information reproduced. Um, all very worthwhile suggestions, all very useful, but the main problem with these is that it's not the landlord who's making these charges more often than not because a, a landlord, a freehold is, is usually cost neutral and it's their managing agent that is providing that professional service and collated information. And so they're not necessarily gonna to want to reduce their fees to 200 pounds plus VAT, somewhere below that anyway. But you do often get instances of fees being considerably higher than that, especially in prime central London, for instance, where management packs can be produced by solicitors because the properties are so complicated and so expensive. They will have a lawyers do it for them. And their packs can be five, six, seven, 800 pounds plus VAT, an enormous amount of money, not necessarily in relation to the value of the property, uh, and then, of course, what happens to the balance over £200? Presumably, it'll be passed through to the landlord to join the general management fees. And it hasn't actually been decided yet, but it's definitely a grey area. Thanks, Will. Simon, our webinar attendees are particularly interested to know your views on how the office market in Cambridge is responding to the pandemic and the work from home edict. Do you see any growth in the office market in Cambridge coming through? And is there a change in what occupiers are looking for? Thanks, Katie. Um, as, as to the question of growth, um, I think that's going to be very difficult to, and, and, and that's really uh, crystal ball gazing uh, into the future. I think the advantage that Cambridge has, it has, it's all about quality. It's quality of that uh, combination of the in IT infrastructure and and the location. I think you have to make uh, a, a reason for an off for someone to come to an office. We can't sort of have dormitory offices. And I think Cambridge is very well positioned for that uh, with, if you like, standard offices around the station. Um, you've got the potential for growth around uh, North Cambridge Station. And then, of course, you have offices mixed with um, R&D facilities or warehousing as you go further out of Cambridge. So I think certainly uh, there is a, uh, you know, a strong uh, quality of office uh, in and around Cambridge. But I think the key thing, I think the key th change I was sort of trying to allude to is the fact that um, 
you won't need the large size foot paints and we don't have many of those. I think that's one of the great advantages um, that uh, we do have quite a mix of um, floor plates available uh, in the office market in Cambridge. And that uh, allows for a lot of flexibility. Uh, and I think that's key. I think what landlords will need to do if they want to maintain their advantage is that those um, offices need to be uh, well connected to the infrastructure, need to be accessible through public transport, uh, which most of it is. Um, and I think there is going to be a change, but um, you know, it isn't, a, 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 there isn't going to be a flight to the home desk. There are lots of issues with home desk. I mean, if we all go to the home desk, I'm sure a lot of those people who, uh, what we should have been doing a year ago with those sort of um, desktop assessments and uh, ergonomics, or well, I can't remember what it's called now, but all that kind of stuff, I'm, I'm sure we haven't been doing that properly. And so from an employment point of view, um, there are a lot of issues uh, uh, for employees at working at home as well. So, um, I think Cambridge is very well placed because it is innovative. It has got good stock. It has got IT infrastructure. So I'm not sure but there should be growth, but there will be a reorganization around those sort of um, more flexible uh, working areas. I, I also don't think um, there'll be a big rush to um, the service office um, uh, space. There isn't a lot of that in Cambridge at all, really. And there's probably only two or three locations and um uh, I, I don't think it does allow for that sort of um come and go you, you still have to take a contract for a period of time um it is an, it's an option it's an, an alternative but i don't think uh, some people seem to think that's a solution it's just one of the options that's available thanks simon and i think we might do one more question possibly we will go to tim for this one if we might um, and we'll probably make this our last question because i'm conscious of the timing uh, so tim as you, you've pointed out that the, the cost of replacing cladding is a is a huge problem um and and there's obviously been uh situations where um uh, first-time buyers have had serious financial issues um sometimes declaring themselves bankrupt um, because of the, the costs associated within uh, the service charge. Uh, can you see this happening more and more? Um, or is there going to be a resolution to this? I think it's hard to overstate just how significant an issue this whole cladding thing is. I, I mean, there's no other topic that any of us have covered today, which is regularly on the national news, television, radio, pretty much every day, it seems at the moment. And uh, and if it's true that the government is about to announce this funding, despite despite how uh, the, our country's finances must be at the moment, that, that tells you that this is a major problem and, and tragedy, really. And it is a tragedy for a lot of people. I think it's not, it, you know, it's, it's a legal issue, but it's a social issue. There are many people here who particularly in this lockdown, have been stuck in small flats and so on with no prospect of getting out of them any time soon, really. So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm afraid there will be people in some very tragic situations. Um, and as I say, I, I think it tells you just how big an issue this is that the government is finding, assume it does, £5 billion from somewhere and, and proposing to go after developers, which I think, I think that's an understandable thing for them to look at because developers have probably got bigger pockets than most leaseholders have. But I think it's a it's a tricky one as well. I mean, you know, if they built the thing 10 years ago in accordance with the relevant regulations, and they'd have no interest in it any longer, exactly on what legal basis they're going to be able to, to do that, I, I, I really don't know. But as I say, it, it, is a, it is a massive issue for very, very many people and, uh, and it won't go away anytime soon. No, absolutely. I completely agree with that, Tim. Thank you. Um, so I think it's it's time to wrap up. Um, uh, again, apologies that we've had some um, issues with Simon's audio today. Um, we have a recording of this which will be put online shortly after this session. And I, I think possibly because I 
I, I, I cut him off while he was in the middle of his presentation. Um, we will re-record Simon's session um, and also record his uh, his comments on the, 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 the questions that were coming through in relation to um, the office market. Um, if you have any other questions or you would like to um, continue, continue the discussion with us, please do uh, get in contact with any of us. It would be, it would be great to, uh, to, to speak to you and we would be really interested in your views um, on the subjects we've been covering today. Um, just as a, um, as, a, as a quick heads up, uh, we have um, a series of webinars which we are running at the moment, uh, some internal ones, um, but also uh, particularly relevant for this audience. You might be interested to note that we are sponsoring a built environment networking um, conference on the 3rd of March titled the Thames Valley Economic Growth and Development Conference. And later in the year, uh, we are also sponsoring the East of England Economic Growth and Development Conference on the 6th of July. And uh, if you'd like any more details about those, do get in touch or have a look at the Built Environment Networking website. So it just remains for me to thank our panelists today. Um, it's, uh, it's been very useful to have this conversation and thank you to all of our attendees uh, for listening and uh, keep in touch and we hope to see you very soon. Thanks very much.